It's 7 p.m. Friday, September 27th, here in Seoul. Coming up on News Center tonight. President Moon Jae-in calls on state prosecutors investigating a scandal-ridden new justice minister to exercise restraint, repeating calls for prosecutorial reform. Japan renews claims over South Korea's easternmost islets of Tokto in its latest defense white paper, prompting an angry response from Seoul. The move will likely worsen what are already heightened tensions between the neighbors. Amid stalled North Korea-U.S. talks, Pyongyang releases a statement painting a grim picture of a third Pyongyang-Washington summit. We'll tell you what's causing the delay of Pyongyang-Washington working-level talks that were deemed imminent. New Center begins now. Good evening to our viewers in Asia and hello to others watching from around the world. Welcome to Ajahn News Center. I'm Han Dan in Seoul. And I'm Noor Adam. Thank you as always for joining us this evening. Our top story, Japan has released its annual defense white paper again, making false territorial claims over South Korea's Tokto Island for the 15th consecutive year. This year, Japan went further to include statements that suggest Japan could militarily respond in case of a foreign incursion into Tokdo Island. Kim ji has more on this and South Korea's reactions. It's been less than a year since a Japanese defense attaché was summoned to Seoul's defense ministry over a dispute regarding Tokyo's claim that its patrol aircraft was targeted by South Korea. This time, officials were summoned over an alarming statement in Japan's annual defense white paper that suggests Japan would send military forces to South Korean territory in case of what it claims would be an incursion. Seoul's defense ministry summoned Japanese defense attaché Watanabe Dasiya Friday afternoon, while Seoul's foreign ministry summoned Daisuke Bibae, the minister for political affairs at the Japanese embassy in Seoul. In the white paper, Japan renewed the false territorial claim it's been making for the past 15 years over South Korea's easternmost Tokyo Island. But what's new this time is that Japan suggested it could scramble fighter jets if the airspace over the island is violated. The paper referred to an incident in July in which a Russian warplane had intruded into the airspace over Tokyo, stating Japan had filed a protest with South Korea for firing warning shots toward the Russian aircraft, an act done in what it called its territory. The white paper says such airspace violations should be dealt with by Japan's Air Self-Defense Force, referring to Article 84 of its Self-Defense Force Act. In response, the South Korean government demanded that Japan immediately rectify such wrongful claims, reiterating that Seoul would respond firmly to any efforts to disrespect its sovereignty over Tokdo Island, which is clearly South Korea's territory considering its history and geography and international law. The government also urged Japan to correct statements regarding Tokyo's claims that a Japanese patrol aircraft was targeted by a South Korean warship in the East Sea last December, which Seoul strongly denies. Seoul also brought up Japan's claim that South Korea is fully to blame for fraying ties stemming from the recent row over trade and the wartime atrocities during Japan's colonial rule over Korea between 1910 and 1945. Here, Japan also blames South Korea for terminating the two countries' military intel sharing pact. Seoul said rather it's Japan that needs to work on restoring trust with Seoul and that the lack thereof is the reason it terminated the pact in August. Kim ji Arirang News. Anticipation has been growing for North Korea and the United States to resume their nuclear talks, but Washington says it hasn't been able to set up a schedule yet. A former North Korean diplomat, meanwhile, says he hopes for a, quote, wise decision from U.S. President Donald Trump, adding he's different from his predecessors. Oh Jung-hee reports. Working-level denuclearization talks between North Korea and the U.S. are not likely to happen in late September after all. Speaking at a press conference in New York on Thursday on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Washington was not able to arrange the schedule for a meeting this month. But he stressed Washington is ready to meet North Korea and believes it is important to do so. After months of deadlock, the North's Vice Foreign Minister Choi Sun hee said in a statement early this month that North Korea was willing to meet with U.S. officials in late September. 
As the U.S. also hinted of taking a new method in its negotiations with the North, working-level talks were highly expected to take place. But the delay, a North Korea expert says, comes as the two sides have not been able to narrow their differences. From North Korea's point of view, that it's not in their interest to initiate or resume the working-level talks with the United States uh, when they believe that it's unlikely that U.S. government is going to change its position toward North Korea. And the expert's point was backed up by what North Korea had to say in another statement released on Friday. Kim ge an advisor to Pyongyang's foreign ministry, said the U.S. has done nothing to implement its promises made at their previous summits, and therefore the prospects for a third Kim Trump summit are dim. He stressed that having another summit wouldn't help efforts for a breakthrough because there are still views in Washington that the North has to nuclearize before any sanctions relief or economic concessions can be provided to regime. The North Korean diplomat called for a, quote, wise and bold decision from President Trump. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Defense officials from Seoul and Washington have reaffirmed that it's important to faithfully implement the UN Security Council resolutions while taking a diplomatic approach in dealing with North Korea's denuclearization. The officials were meeting in Seoul at the 16th Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue held this week for two days. The South Korean Defense Ministry says the two also had in-depth discussions of the transfer of wartime operational control to Seoul from Washington and agreed to strengthen efforts to achieve it. And with the defense cost-sharing talks between the two sides having recently kicked off, the two sides reportedly review the progress of their joint task force, working to improve the details and implementation of the agreement. The chairman of South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff will be in the U.S. next week to attend a change of command ceremony for his U.S. counterpart. General Park Han-gi will meet both the outgoing General Joseph Dunford and the incoming General Mark Milley to discuss the Seoul-Washington alliance and the situation on the Korean peninsula. The U.S. will also organize a trilateral meeting with Park's Japanese counterpart Koji Yamazaki after the event. This will be the first time the top military officers of the three nations will meet since Seoul's decision in August to withdraw from its intel sharing agreement with Tokyo. President Moon Jae-in returned to Seoul yesterday from New York where he met his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump and attended the U.N. General Assembly. For more on his trip, we have our Shin Se-min in the studio for us. Se-min, first of all, welcome back. You also had a busy week in New York. Let's have a little bit of a, a recap. Can we safely say Moon and Trump's meeting gave a boost to Washington's uh, next round of working level talks with Pyongyang? It sure did. The presidential office sees this trip at this time as a more successful one to New York. One of the major reasons is that President Moon reaffirmed South Korea's strong and ironclad alliance with the U.S. while cementing, while with the President Moon and Trump cementing their strategy in leading the Korean peace process in the right direction. And in the ninth Moon-Trump summit that occurred this uh, Monday, President Moon pushed hard to get that uh, Kim-Trump summit to happen soon. And he also invited the international community to be part of that Korean peace process by turning the demilitarized zone into the international peace zone. And the presidential office says that specific part has an implied message to the North that the rest of the world will support its security guarantee for the regime. So that alone is a way of bringing North Korea back to its negotiating table and perhaps encouraging the regime to make a more concrete steps towards the denuclearization. Now, Simon, uh, so for President Moon, this was an important chance to speed up the denuclearization process. What can you expect from now? Now, for one, the nuclear talks between North Korea and the U.S. is looking to begin in the weeks to come. And Presidents Moon and Trump are hoping that will lead to summit number three between North Korea's Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump. And President Trump himself publicly said he's open to meeting Kim Jong-un again this year. And on top of that, we had the presidential office and the nation's intelligence agency cautiously predicting that leader Kim might visit South Korea to attend the ASEAN Special Summit's 
scheduled at the end of November. So it all depends on how the nuclear talks go between the North and the U.S. If there's progress, it'll definitely lead to more nuclear diplomacy down the line. But apart from that, there's also a series of multinational diplomatic summit meetings scheduled in the rest of the year. Now, there's the ASEAN summit in late October and in the first week of November and the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation or APEC in Chile in that same month. And lastly, the Korea ASEAN Special Summit, as I've said, in the Busan, South Korea. So all of these events giving the major players of the nuclear diplomacy an opportunity to uh, reaffirm and reassess perhaps some of the progress made on the sidelines of that uh, uh, multinational meetings. Right now, outside of North Korean diplomacy, did we learn anything about other diplomatic issues such as with Japan? Not so much, at least on the surface. For one, President Moon Jae-in and the Japanese uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe did not meet on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, although they were both in New York. And uh, the presidential office reportedly said that the discussions with Japan are underway behind the scenes, but there has been no concrete outcomes or progress just yet. But here are the two dates that the top office considers as potential dates that could trigger a turning point. That's October 27th. Second, the Japanese Emperor's enthronement ceremony and November 22nd. That's the termination of the military intelligence sharing pact with Japan called the GSOMIA or the General Security of Military Information Agreement. So if the behind the scenes discussions in fact do make progress, the top office reportedly anticipates that the leaders of the two sides will meet face to face eventually perhaps on the sidelines of that ASEAN meeting in Thailand early November. So there are still a lot of diplomatic challenges left for South Korea. We'll just have to see how it unfolds from now. Thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure. President Moon Jae-in once again emphasized the importance of reforming the nation's prosecution. This comes amid intensifying investigation on the fraud and corruption scandal surrounding Justice Minister Cho Guk. Our Park Hee-jun has more on the president's remarks. President Moon Jae-in has called for an extensive shakeup of the prosecution in response to growing demand from the public. Referring to the ongoing investigation surrounding Justice Minister Cho Guk, Presidential spokesperson Ko min -jung told reporters Friday that President Moon stressed the need for prosecution reform that changes how prosecutions and investigations are carried out. We ask the prosecution to reflect on the reality that demands for reform are increasing, despite the fact that they are now engaged in a strict, full-fledged investigation without any interference. And President Moon added that it's important to respect human rights as the prosecution exerts power directly over the people. When asked why Friday's briefing was given, the spokesperson said there is no particular reason. These are the president's first official remarks on the corruption investigation, and they were apparently aimed at protecting Cho against the active push for his removal. They're also being viewed as an indirect warning to the prosecution's controversial probe of the allegations surrounding Cho and his family, the most recent incident being their raid of his home earlier in the week. <coughs> President Moon says whether the justice minister is held responsible will be determined only by judicial procedures. But in the meantime, he asked for state affairs to be carried out regardless of the probe. Park Hee-jun, Irang News. South Korea has confirmed a ninth case of African swine fever. The government is stepping up its quarantine efforts, which include putting down tens of thousands of pigs. Here's the official announcement this morning. Take a listen. Nine cases have been confirmed so far. Five out of the nine confirmed cases originated in Kanghua County. A few suspected cases turned out negative, two in Yangju, a city close to Seoul, and another in Yeoncheon. All the confirmed cases are fairly close to North Korea, such as the northern areas of Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon. All pigs in Kanghua County will be culled, which is around 38,000 pigs. The government has also banned all vehicles in the livestock industry in northern Gyeonggi-do from leaving the area. Authorities are currently working to find out exactly how the disease first got into South Korea. 
President Moon Jae-in held a summit today with the Prime Minister of Bulgaria, Boyko Borisov. They agreed to boost their bilateral partnerships in the fields of nuclear energy and ICT. President Moon noted that Bulgaria wants to introduce nuclear reactors and upgrade its weapon system, saying South Korea, with its expertise, would be the optimal partner. Prime Minister Borisov reaffirmed his support for the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Not one single hydrogen fluoride was exported to South Korea from Japan in August. This follows Tokyo's decision to restrict exports to Seoul of three strategic materials used in semiconductors and displays. The Japanese Finance Ministry's monthly trade statistics showed that exports of hydrogen fluoride to South Korea stood at zero for the month of August. Tokyo had emphasized that it would allow exports to South Korea within 90 days if it does not find any problems with export requests. Yet only one export request of the material has been allowed since July, and such statistics are increasing worries for South Korean companies that rely on the materials. Jeffrey Schott, a former U.S. Treasury Department official and senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, is here in Seoul for the World Knowledge Forum and a special lecture organized by the Institute of Global Economics. Our business correspondent Kim Hesong sat down with him for his insight on global trade and the economic outlook. Let's take a look. The protracted U.S.-China trade spat has not only resulted in each side applying tariffs on billions of dollars of goods, it's also weighing on global growth. The IMF says the tariffs imposed by Washington and Beijing could drive down global GDP by 0.8 percent for next year, and the U.S. Fed says the drop in global GDP could be as high as 1 percent or 850 billion U.S. dollars. Well, the tariffs have, have an impact, uh, but I think less well understood, the much greater impact is on the perception of what future growth is going to be uh, to investors who have to make the decisions whether to uh, invest in new plant and equipment, whether uh, to change their supplier relationships. All of these actions are inefficient and they waste resources that could otherwise be used more productively and then that will have a drag on growth. We're seeing warnings of a possible global recession. What's your take on the global economic outlook? Well, I'd say take what the IMF uh, estimates and deduct a few tenths of a point for all the major countries. The trend seems to be weakening and and the forces weakening growth in the major economies are are, are uh, sort of reinforcing each other and when you have a, a impending election like we have in the united states coming up it can lead to a lot of hot rhetoric uh, that obviously roils the markets and uh, creates much more volatility uh, so uh, i think uh, not a, uh, a serious crisis like we had 10 years ago, uh, but a significant weakening in global economic growth. And that's not good news for the United States or for Korea. With low interest rates, low growth and low inflation, some economists say South Korea could face a long-term economic slowdown like Japan's lost decades. What's your take on this? I think just as uh, Prime Minister Abe had a had a third arrow of Abenomics with structural reforms. So there's still a lot of room in Korea uh, for domestic economic reforms that can boost productivity. Uh, and uh, the resources of, of uh, the Korean uh, people are very, very large, very important, and they can be better used. And uh, so while the international climate is weakening, uh, there's still the opportunity uh, to, pr to pursue domestic uh, initiatives that will unlock some of the productivity gains that have been held back.
Dr. Schott added that encouraging productive investment and having a more efficient utilization of services in the whole economy, not just the manufacturing sector, will be key. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. Korean scientists have developed a new test that can help diagnose Alzheimer's disease early. Although there is no cure for Alzheimer's, early diagnosis is key to treating system, uh, symptoms. Our Oh Soo-young has more. It takes just a drop of blood to find out whether you have Alzheimer's disease, even before you notice the symptoms. A revolutionary test kit developed by Korean scientists at Gyeongsang National University has made it possible to objectively diagnose cases of Alzheimer's at an early stage. In the past, doctors had to rely on radioactive imaging scans or cognitive tests based on symptoms of dementia, which only showed up after the condition had progressed to a certain extent. Now a sample of bodily fluid, including blood, saliva and sweat, can be used to test for the disease. The research team led by Kim myung -ok used fluorescent nanoparticles to detect eight microRNAs and 21 indicators associated with memory decline. I chose to focus on Alzheimer's because it makes up at least 70 percent of dementia cases, but the reasons for developing the condition vary greatly depending on the individual's environment. So that is why we selected 21 indicators. Also, microRNAs can be easily found in blood, sweat and saliva. If key microRNAs or antigens linked to Alzheimer's are present, they show up in fluorescent colors. When the fluorophore and quencher are close together, the quencher absorbs the energy or emission of light from the fluorophore. But if there is a relevant microRNA or antigen, the distance increases so the quencher no longer suppresses the light. This method is expected to increase the accuracy of early diagnosis. When you attach a biotin protein, it enhances the color compared to previous tests, which were direct and gave off non-specific results, which largely affected the accuracy of the tests. The findings have been published in scientific reports this month, and the test kit is already undergoing clinical tests to be commercialized later this year. Professor Kim hopes to further develop ways to detect and effectively treat dementia through customized precision medicine at an early stage. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News, Jinju. Seoul is hosting its annual Welcome Week for foreign tourists. The capital has partnered with 190 companies to offer discounts on a wide range of services, including dining, shopping and accommodation. To find out more, foreign tourists should visit seoulwelcomeweek.com. You can also download a hard copy of what's called the Seoul Welcome Week online card to get discounts both online and offline. The event runs until October 6th. The Seoul City Government is offering free guided tours around the old streets and neighbourhoods along the stone wall that once protected the capital city. It's a great way to spend a cool autumn evening with family or friends, getting a bit of exercise and learning about Seoul's past. Won Jung Hwan reports. Some 30 people wait patiently for the start of a free guided tour of the Seoul's ancient wall, also known as Hanyang Tosong. With specially chosen heritage experts, the tour takes participants under the autumn moonlight, down old roads and through villages along the stone wall, which was built back in the Joseon dynasty. The wall could be a bit steep, but those on the tour will be able to learn the history of the massive stone wall that once encircled the capital city. As visitors walk along the wall, they get a chance to listen to how the wall, with an average height of 7 meters, protected Seoul from 1396 to 1910. While some parts of the fortifications were destroyed during Japan's colonial rule and the Korean War, visitors can still feel the wall's grandness. Following the ridges of Bugaksan, Naksan, Namsan and Inangsan, the four main mountains surrounding the center of Seoul, the trails from the Joseon era provide a different view of the city. I really enjoyed hearing stories from residents living near Hanyang Doseong. The tour program wasn't only about the history of the wall, but it also told us how the people in the area are now living together with the ancient wall. I've been here a couple of times, but since I live in Incheon, it was always hard for me to come during the night. But through such an organized tour program, I was able to not only trek at night, but also learn about the history. 
There are two more free tours offered by Seoul this year, taking place in the evenings of October 15th and 17th. Only 35 adults can take each tour, and spots are located on a first-come, first-served basis. You can apply via the city's reservation website from 10 a.m. on October 7th. Won Jo-hwan, Arirang News. Gangnam in southern Seoul continues to be one of Seoul's hottest attractions for years. To further boost Gangnam's global image, largely fostered by now world-famous singer Psy, an annual cultural festival is being held. Our Um Ji Young was at the opening ceremony. The 2019 Gangnam Festival officially kicked off on Thursday. The crowd at the opening ceremony numbered more than 2,000, and they were treated to entertainment by K-pop bands, singers, choirs, and even a fireworks show. I saw uh, good, very nice performances, and, uh, all, and the topic is uh, Gangnam Festival, and it's uh, about the history of Gangnam, about the lifestyle of Gangnam. So they did a performance. Uh, depicting the, <clears throat> how dynamic the life is in Gangnam. The festival runs through October 6th with various programs for visitors to enjoy. This year's Gangnam Festival includes a range of concerts from K-pop to classical music, as well as street parades, fashion shows and other activities taking place across Gangnam-gu district. The head of the Gangnam-gu district office said they'll show the world the excellence of Gangnam through the festival and use it as a springboard to attract 10 million visitors to the district. The concept is the whole district being the stage. We are offering visitors 35 different programs. The festival is big and we'll see around 2,500 people take to the stage. It's also an interactive festival where people from the district come and perform together. The festival's director said things that Gangnam should be proud of, such as beauty and information technology, will be displayed at various exhibitions, including G-Culture Festa. The theme is Sensation Gangnam, which means this year's festival also portrays things you may not have known about the district. For instance, during last year's event, the fashion show was held by a famous designer, but this year it will be held by amateur designers building their careers in Gangnam. The festival also features a series of cultural showcases like musicals and operas where the visitors can appreciate more highbrow art. Um Ji Young, Arirang News. K pop has continued to grow on the world stage in the last decade. But can K pop reach the next level? Billboard and Nielsen Music discussed global digestion of K pop and its future at the World Knowledge Forum in Seoul. Our Kan Young Woo has this report. K pop, the biggest music phenomenon since the Beatlemania, has rightfully become synonymous with words like top, hot, best, and global success. But how has it captivated the hearts of literally millions of people across the globe? It's for a number of reasons. But fundamentally, K-pop is more than just the music. It is, it's about the fashion, it's about the dance, it's about the production as well. Um, K-pop is also a very visual medium. And with YouTube being as, as big a platform as it is globally, K-pop thrives. According to a survey by Nielsen Music, K-pop fans spend more hours per week listening to their favorite artists than fans of any other genre or artist. They're also more active on social media, using it to stay informed on their favorite idols while keeping their names relevant and trending online. The total K-pop album sales in the U.S. took a huge leap last year when the figures skyrocketed to some 900,000, a 600% increase from the previous year. What's remarkable about this is that while K-pop's popularity and profitability surged in the U.S., the American album market slided down, resulting in a 16% decrease in the same period. Experts and observers in the industry are now raising a question that would probably be answered anytime soon. What's K-pop's chance of becoming number one on the Billboard Hot 100? Listen, the day's coming. I mean, we saw it with BTS and Halsey, and it may take a collaboration to help push it through the door. 
but you know, there have been foreign number ones in the past and foreign top tens, and, and I, I promise you we'll see some soon. With BTS dominating the Billboard Social 50 chart, a ranking of the most active artists on the global social networking sites, for 145 consecutive weeks now, the seven-member boy band who has stirred the biggest fandom since the Beatles, according to international outlets, seems to be on its way to becoming the first K-pop artist to claim the top spot of the Billboard Hot 100. Kanyo, Arirang News. France is bidding farewell to the late former French President Jacques Chirac. In a nationally televised speech on Thursday, President Emmanuel Macron paid his respects, describing him as a, quote, great Frenchman. The Eiffel Tower turned dark to commemorate Chirac, a prominent figure in French politics for five decades. France will hold a national day of mourning on Monday. Chirac died at the age of 86 on Thursday after serving as the French leader, prime minister and mayor of Paris. South Korea's central city of Daejeon has been chosen to host a global forum for aspiring young scientists and engineers. The city announced today that it had won the competition to host the Expo Sciences International, which will open in 2023. Around 2,000 young people from all over the world will gather to exchange cultural and scientific knowledge and ideas. It will be the first time the event will be held in East Asia. To commemorate Hangul Day or the Korean Alphabet Day, on October 9th, the King Sejong Institute will run Korean language classes inside Gyeongbokgung Palace. Special classes will be held every afternoon on October 7th, 9th and the 10th for two hours, including a group tour around the palace. The program is only available for 40 foreigners each time. Applications must be made by next Tuesday via the Institute's website. The number of confirmed or suspected cases of vaping-related illnesses across the U.S. has risen to 805. The health authorities there are advising people to stop using e-cigarettes and other vaping devices. As of Thursday, the number of cases was up 52 percent from the previous week and included 10 deaths. No single ingredient or additive has been implicated, but most of the products in question are believed to be from a black market or include THC, the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. It was a pleasantly mild end to our work week here in Seoul today. And hopefully the good weather will continue into the weekend. To find out if it will, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. Good evening, guys. The weather was decent in the capital, but not so good if you were in the south. Now, the rain that started in Jeju earlier in the day has spread to the southern regions with up to 60 millimeters expected for some areas until Sunday. Now, Saturday in the capital will mostly be under sunny spells due to the high pressure front, but there may be times when you will see light passing showers. Not heavy enough to affect your outing, though. Now, as for the southern provinces, there will be some dark clouds or even rain with thunder and lightning. Now we are going to see higher morning lows than the seasonal average. Tomorrow, Seoul and Daejeon will wake up to 19 degrees Celsius, whereas Busan and Jeju will get a warmer start to the day at 21 and 22 degrees respectively. Now as usual, Seoul will see a big boost into our day, getting up to 27 degrees. Now meanwhile, down south where it's being soaked by the rain, temperatures will only rise a couple of degrees. Now, even as we enter October next week, the daytime highs are expected to be up in the high 20s. Now, more rain is in the forecast for the southern regions, while the capital regions will continue to be under clear skies. Now, also, there is a tropical low pressure front that could develop into a typhoon this weekend. Now, if the typhoon does occur, it will be this year's seventh to approach the Korean Peninsula since 1959. Now, we'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
OK, that will wrap up today's Arirang News Centre. Thank you, as always, for watching. News in Death is coming up next. Don't go anywhere.